Hi, everybody. This is Sue Ann Jackson. Welcome to the continuing series of webinars for the ADRCs for 2016. We're excited to have everybody on here. This one in particular is geared um, around gathering data. I want to remind you guys that we do record these webinars. And it will be posted, hopefully, by next week, along with the PowerPoint. If you did not get the PowerPoint in the email this morning, um, Rhonda has posted it as a handout on the system. And you can also shoot Lori, L-O-R-I dot C dot Watt, W-A-T-T, at state dot O-R dot U-S. Uh, shoot her a little email and just say, need webinar material, and she will send you the PowerPoint. Uh, we do keep everybody muted to avoid feedback and background noise. And then, um, so if you have a question, don't hesitate to text chat it um, or put it in the questions section. I'll be watching for those while Rhonda does the speaking. Uh, if you're a group site by any chance, we'd love it if you'd let us know in the chat. Uh, who all's there, or send Rhonda or I an email just so we know who else is there with you. Um, I want to remind you that after the webinar, there will be an email shortly following from Lori that will have a link to a Survey Monkey, so you can let us know what you thought about the webinar. We really do pay attention to those and try to look them over and make sure we can constantly improve and continually improve our webinars. Um, Okay, thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. And I have beside me my awesome team member, Rhonda Beautifelt, who has all this amazing knowledge in her head about data analyzing and data gathering. I do want to let you guys know that we did think for a few minutes about pulling in all of the data systems we use and decided that would be way overwhelming for all of us. So Rhonda will just be talking about the SPR today. Um, so she, you know, we won't be bringing in the RTZ data today. We'll do another webinar on RTZ. So we really appreciate you being here with us, and I'm going to turn it over to Rhonda at this time. So hello, everybody. As Sue said, um, my name is Rhonda, Sue Ann said. I am Rhonda Budafel, and I am absolutely delighted to talk with you guys today. And I'm pleased to see that we have seven out of nine ADRCs and 10 out of 17 AAAs represented today. That is so exciting. Way to go. So thank you for taking an interest in learning more about the data that AAAs and the ADRCs collect and report in the state program report, otherwise known as the SPR. I'm hopeful that after this webinar, you will all find that you have a greater understanding of your own agency's data, that it's more meaningful and the, the content is, is something that you find more relevant and, and interesting. I recognize most of you, but for those not familiar with me, I'm a member of the State Unit on Aging, and my primary focus is on administrative functions such as contracts, fiscal, state, and federal rule, and data collecting and reporting. I mean, it's my bread and butter. I love data. So um, that's enough about me. How about if we move on? So remember the five W's and the one H from school? We are going to explore uh, two of the W's and the H. Just as good household managers now um, know how they spend their money last year, the federal government also wants to know how Oregon spent the funds they provided for services to aging and vulnerable Oregonians. So by reporting the service and consumer demographics noted on this slide, your agency is actually evidencing that Oregon is serving the target population the Older Americans Act funding was intended for. So that is what the SPR is. The why. With so much happening back east, I tell you, it's hard to grasp that the data is actually even looked at, but I can tell you firsthand that it is. I experienced that this year. Um, 
Just two months ago, our Region 10 ACL program coordinator contacted me because a representative at OMB had noticed the amount of funds that Oregon expended on elder abuse awareness and prevention. And OMB was putting together a report for President Obama. And because our SPR reported over a million dollars expended, they wanted to just call and ensure that the number was accurate. And I was really impressed because we assemble all of this data year after year after year and it's easy to think that it is not being um, viewed. I mean, we just, we go through all these these motions and put all this effort into it and for what? Well, they really are looking at it. And so I think it's very important that everyone recognize that ACL is actually required to pull this data together annually and they report this to the president, to Congress, and OMB utilizes this data in determining what the upcoming presidential budget, recommended budget will be. So what happens if our data is inaccurate? If an ADRC or a AAA is sloppy with their reporting, um, it could be overreported numbers, it could be underreported numbers, it could be a lack of demographics. Hey, I'm sorry you guys, somehow this slide doesn't appear to be in um, in your your presentation there. I apologize for that. But um, funding is actually when what happens when the data is inaccurate is funding is not is actually awarded appropriately. What happens is the funding is not awarded appropriately because OMB determines the amount of funds to allocate to us based on available funds on our state population and on our reported performance numbers. And you should consider the SPR as a performance. A report for your agency basically and then I aggregate them all together and we report one statewide uh, performance report. If NSIP funds are, if they, uh, well actually NSIP funds are allocated solely by the number of NSIP eligible meals that you reported in the previous year's SPR. So if indeed those numbers are not reported accurately, you might be shorting your agency additional funding. So it's very important to make sure that you are documenting each NSIP eligible meal that is being served. And if any single AAA provides inaccurate data, all of the AAAs in the state will suffer the consequences. And it's really important that you recognize that our SPR is actually going to be viewable on the Administration of Community Living's website. So it's out there for the whole nation, international actually, to view. So accuracy is very important. Rhonda, before we get going too much further, we're using some acronyms here and we may have some folks who used OMB and now you've used MSIP. And we might have some people who aren't quite familiar with all those acronyms. Could you explain what they are? Thank you, Sue Ann. <laughs> yes, NSIP actually stands for Nutritional Services Incentive Program. Um, NSIP used to be referred to as as, um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting, it's the Commodity Food Program. And, and it's been NSIP for about 10 years now and I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm escaping, it's escaping my mind what it used to be referred to, but I think you, you probably may recognize um, that. And the uh, OMB is the Office of Business and Management, that is a federal department. And SPR, you know, is State Program Report. Did I use any other? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I think we're good. Okay, so let's proceed on to the next slide. All right. Okay. So we are going to... Is your travel drive here? It is. Um, I think we're... Hang on a second. We're going to do a switcheroo here. I'm uh, not sure. It, it appears that what I've done is I've provided Sue Ann with the wrong PowerPoint. It's not matching. Hopefully it's not matching what you are seeing. I hope that what I have is, is what you have in front of you. And so if you'll just hold in place, 
you should find um, slide second. number five says at the top, what happens if our data is incorrect? Would somebody uh, chat in and let me know if that's what is in your present handout? And then number six um, will be titled Rain Web Application. And so I'd like to hear from you. Is that what your number six slide you on your handout is? Thank you for your patience. I think we're good now. So I'm not seeing, okay, so let me just double check this. Um, okay, so you guys have the right one. I just had the wrong one, and it looks like we're all Terrific. connected now. Okay, so thanks for your patience. Yes, thank you so much. I'm very sorry that happened. So here's a simple overview of the SPR process. Um, data is entered into Oregon Access and RTZ. Each night at midnight, Oregon Access uploads information entered that day to RAIN, which stands for Reporting and Analyzing Information for NAPA. RTZ data is actually entered in a different manner, but now I'll discuss that in an upcoming webinar plan to introduce the AAAs to the federal government's new state reporting tool. And can you just say what NAPIS is, just in case? Yes, NAPA stands for the, it's actually an old term related to a federal data system that they provided to all of the states for reporting. It's an old antiquated DOS system, and it stands for National Aging Program Information System. We use that term, even though the system is out of date, um, the federal government still refers to all of this data that we are required to collect as NAPAS data, and you will find that, that we use this data, um, I mean, we use this term um, regularly. This is NAPAS data that you are inputting into Oregon Access and RTZ. So looking at the top right, or the top left, you're going to see that the data is entered into Oregon Access. It uploads nightly at midnight into RAIN. And as I said, RAIN is a web data application, a web-based data application. So it extracts the data from Oregon Access each night. And so if you input data today, it's going to show up in rain tomorrow for all of you to view. And we can go into viewing that. We'll, we'll talk about that a little later on in the webinar. So going back up, looking at that top right icon on the computer monitor, you'll see the next step is transferring the SPR from rain to the federal system. The feds examine the data, they ask questions, and eventually they provide to OMB for use in that recommended presidential budget for the upcoming federal year. So now let's move on to how. We've talked about who, what, um, where, when, why we do this, and now how. How the report gets to Washington, D.C., we talked about. So we're briefly just going to go over um, how the report can be useful to your agency. Three things immediately come to my mind. Um, you can demonstrate program value and service trends to your staff, to your advisory boards, your legislators, Oregon senators, civic groups um, who are operating in your district, fundraising, you know, as you try to fundraise and help them understand um, your district's constituents so that they recognize what your performance is and how many people you're serving, um, the vulnerability of your consumers. You can use it to develop interest in your program. And you can use year-to-year -year comparisons actually to track your performance and the trends and just the general health of your district's consumer base. So those are just a, a few things of how this data can be used by your agency. Okay, so let's get ready and let's explore the state program report. So the state program report is 32 pages in length. It may be 33 depending upon how many other services the AAAs report. Um, typically other services will, 
will um, take up two pages, but sometimes um, it has gone a third re a third page. But so it's typically 32 pages in length. There's four sections in total. Section one is the client and caregiver characteristics. Section two is our service financials. Section three is all about the your agency and the state. And section four is the developmental accomplishments that you and the state report. So let's see. I think we have about 60 minutes remaining. Um, please feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions during the remainder of this webinar. It is, it's going to get technical, and I will try to be very careful to make certain that I am not glossing over anything that, that you understand what we're going to be looking at. And this is Sue Ann. I'm watching, so text chat your questions, and I'm watching for those while Rhonda's focusing on the presentation. So we'll try to get them in as soon as you let us know what they are. Great. So next up, we are going to explore Section 1, which is Client and Caregiver Characteristics. So this is the first page of the SPR. The data we're going to review today is actually an assembly of all 17 SPRs into one state report. So this doesn't represent um, a single AAA. This is our statewide report. The top row identifies 50,649 consumers received a registered service. Now you might ask, what's a registered service? That's something we will review um, just and we're going to review registered and unregistered um, in just a couple more slides, so we'll go over that. The middle row is the total of all unregistered services, the total, com com the total number of consumers. And I want you to notice how many more consumers there are. We went from 50,000 clear up to 345,000. And the last row is an estimate of all consumers. So I'm, I'm not sure if I distinguished this. The center row is unregistered. So it's unduplicated of those consumers who received an unregistered service. The bottom row is actually referred to as an estimate of all consumers. And the reason it's an estimate is because the top row is definitely unduplicated consumers. The bottom row is the total number of consumers served. However, because the same consumer likely receives both a registered service and an unregistered service may have been consumed, then the number is not considered unduplicated because that person may have been counted twice. All right, now we should be on um, slide 11. So in your handouts, hopefully it says 11 registered services. These are registered services. A registered service is a service that requires not only reporting the unduplicated consumer count and the units, but it also requires client demographics. The demographics are what really demonstrates to the federal government that we are serving the targeted vulnerable populations that the Older Americans Act funding has been intended for. So when you're looking at this list of registered services, you might notice how these are basically one-on-one. -on -one. So you can consider a registered service is one of those where it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one type of service. Personal care, homemaker, chore, a home delivered meal, adult daycare, case management, assisted transportation, congregate meals, nutrition counseling, caregiver counseling, caregiver support groups, respite care, and supplemental services to caregivers. Moving on to slide number 12, these are some of the unregistered services. We have a lot of unregistered also to choose from, and as you are likely aware, each AAA has local control over what services they will provide in their district, and it is actually based upon the local need of your area. And I'm sure you can imagine that the needs in the urban area are likely far different than those needs in a rural area, such as La Grande, um, Harney County, those type of, of situations. So it's good that you have local control and can decide how your dollars are to be utilized in addition to the other required services that your agency must utilize funding for. So 
as I said, um, unregistered services do not require demographics. It makes sense. It might, I mean, think about transportation. If you are paying, um, let's say, Elk Hog is Lane County, and they are providing dollars to the transit in Lane. It's not feasible for a bus driver to ask that individual who is getting on the bus to complete a NAFAS registration form. Um, so even hash mark how many um, you know, people got on his bus, that, that is something that is not easy and it's not expected. Um, legal assistance falls into this unregistered because we want to keep the privacy of that individual. However, one of the things that ACL will be moving forward with, and I think we're going to see this in the newly um, reauthorized Older Americans Act, is we will be adding qualifiers into Oregon Access so that we can further distinguish the type of legal service that was being sought. sought. Was it an age discrimination um, suit? Was it housing? Um, was it to aid in, in achieving medical benefits or any kind of benefits, those type of things. But we, are, we still will never enter in a date of birth. Uh, we won't enter in any demographics on the, the consumer, just a consumer count, a unit count, and then eventually we will be having, you will be having your um, providers also identify a category of the type of service Okay, so when okay. Um, we have a, oh, um, I think we have a question. Let's well, take it's, a minute. It's more of a comment. Um, mm -hmm. Just a note that currently we do treat disease prevention health promotion as if it were a registered service because of the additional state funding we receive to support those services. <laughs> Hi, Beth, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. That is another a very important um, distinction. I so appreciate you saying that, Jennifer. One of the things that you will find from year to year, depending upon, in fact, the source of the funds. And so um, the federal government is not interested in our demographics for those who are, at least they're not, I should rephrase that. Presently, they are not interested in receiving demographics for those consumers who are attending an evidence-based health activity. However, the legislative body has Oregon's legislative body has allocated a very significant sum to the AAA so that they can provide health or evidence-based health promotion activities. And one of the caveats with this funding is that we come back and we can report to the legislators the services, the number of individuals, and the demographics. So we want to be able to evidence to them the vulnerability of that consumer and um, you know the com those that have been complete those consumers who completed the course and so you will find depending upon the source we may need to change um, the reporting criteria so that we can fit our own extra reporting criteria outside of the federal government but those within our state. Thank you again, Jennifer. I appreciate that. All right, so um, I did have a little note here too. If you would like a full list of the service units and the definitions for the Older Americans Act services and Oregon Project Independent Services, you will find that actually on our website. And um, you can also go to the list of transmittals and look up action requests from the year 2011, and you'll want to look up um, the transmittal 047 under action request. Okay, now we're going to look at page two of your SPR. This is where we really dive into some fascinating information. I just, I, this is incredible. So I want you to look here. This SPR contains the reported demographics. The page two is reported demographics of all clients in Oregon who received a registered service. Now note that we are actually looking right here at the total registered consumers. And then if we were looking at this electronically, we could then click on the congregate meals, we could click on nutrition counseling and assisted transportation, and we would individually see the data for each of those three other services. 
And note the reference also to cluster 1 and cluster 2. It says that on the line that says B. So section 1, Elder Dukayans, B, general character characteristics. The difference there is um, in cluster 1 and cluster 2, you were, as we proceed, you'll see a difference in the data that, as, that is represented there. And ACL categorizes the registered services into clusters. And also with the, the um, caregiver information, since they've already used cluster 1 and 2, they actually assigned group 1 and group 2 to caregivers. So um, you'll notice that on, on subsequent place, pages. <laughs> Okay, let's go on to um, 14. So on your notes, it should be page 14. And this is the SPR pages 3, 4, and 5. And so what you'll see here is when I had mentioned if you click on congregate meals, this is the detail. So whereas, so Anne, if you go back one again, mm -hmm. on the section 1B, you'll notice that the total clients on here is 50,000. 49 and of those this is pretty <laughs> amazing um, only 5,660 actually are below poverty now look down to the next line you're going to see of this 50,649 consumers the total with the age reported is 39,743 so 10,906 have no age reported. Now of these 39,743, run across that line. This is what's so fascinating to me. So you're going to see the age of the consumer. So 14,857 of those consumers are between the ages of 60 to 74. 11,870 are 75 through 84 and a whopping almost 9,000 consumers are 85 and over and out there and receiving. That means they're, they're getting to a congregate meal site. Um, they are possibly receiving assisted transportation to get to that site, but I mean 85 and over, almost 9,000 people, that is fantastic. Okay, so now we're going to look at just congregate meals in the same way. So as you're reading your own report, you're going to look through and again, you're going to see. So for example, statewide in congregate meals, the total number was 34,432. 2646 of those were below poverty. Um, we have 10,010 had no age reported. 14,933 of this 30,000 um, 34,000 were female, males only 9,587 and then again going across you'll see how many of those males are at poverty and their age. So whereas 2,537 females over 85 made it to the congregate site, um, almost 15,000 males that are over 85 were also eating a meal. Then we have our gender missing, the number of rural clients. Rural is um, designated by that zip code and each year, I, you may not realize this, but each year um, this, the U.S. Post Office actually assigns, they, they break open new zip codes and so I go and I'll get a new zip code table and we'll upload that into Oregon Access. So as you are creating your consumer record, you are inputting the zip code and it is then designating whether in fact this individual in the SPR will be a rural or not. We have poverty missing, so you'll see 19,837 consumers um, either didn't report on the NAPAS registration whether they were below or above poverty or you may have this data on your NAPAS registration form in your office or at your vendor, your providers, and it just didn't get into Oregon Access. And I'm working with um, a data researcher here in DHS who is actually creating some queries and I have asked him to create 
a data pool that identifies the name of each consumer record who has any demographics missing by district. So each of these AAAs will receive, and I've asked that it be pulled quarterly. So as soon as we get the first report done and he gets it to me, I'll get that out to you and then you can begin to improve your data by going in and inputting the missing information. And if you are not in the habit of having your consumers regularly, annually actually is what I mean by regularly. If you're not in the habit of having your consumers regularly update their registration form, I recommend you do that because obviously um, somebody may not have been at poverty last year and they are now. And the new poverty uh, guidelines come out every February and so they may now be at poverty or, um, you know, Somebody might have passed away, and so now one is living alone, and so that is most certainly um, considered vulnerable. And so as you look through here, you'll also see that the federal government wants to know the number of these 34,432 um, congregate patrons, how many of those live alone, and you'll see here 10,992. 15,289 are unknown. So anyway, I won't go through here any farther. You can actually see where I, well, I've, I've gone down to the ethnicity and the race. And um, so you can see also the breakout of the race and ethnicity of those consumers that Oregon has. And, and we're going to ask Rhonda because she talks really nice and fast. So I'm going to ask her to just take a breath and give you guys a chance to absorb what she's been telling you and see if anybody has any questions. Um, for her before we move on from here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we'll just give you a second while she's changing pages and just in case people have questions or thoughts or comments so far, um, otherwise we'll let her move forward. <laughs> okay, not to okay. any questions. Great, so if you guys are ready to continue along, we're now going to look at the registered services in cluster one and then on to the activities of daily living in the client detail. So cluster one services are personal care, homemaker, chore, home delivered meal, adult daycare, and case management. Typically the AAAs are not utilizing Oregon, I mean Older Americans Act funds to provide these cluster one services with the exception of home delivery and case management. The majority of funds that are supporting these services are actually Oregon Project Independence. Now an activity of daily living is, these, these are um, eating, uh, the ADLs here, eating, dressing, bathing, toileting, transferring in and out of bed or a chair, walking, that type of thing. So let's go ahead and we will move on. So the activities of the daily, the eating, dressing, bathing, toileting, transferring, the higher the number indicates a higher impairment. So when you move on to the, what is known as Section 1C, there are six pages in this particular section of your SPR and it breaks down the consumers. So here the very first page is the total cluster one clients. So you can see that this is 17,165 and if we were then to select other, the, the other pages, we would determine how many of those received chore, case management, personal care, home delivered meals, homemaker, and adult day health. So let's move on to slide 18. This is personal care and so you can see of personal care, 635 consumers, 104 of them had zero ADLs. We have 60 with one ADL, 67 with two, and 139 had three ADLs and more. And then again, just as how we had reviewed the former page, you're going to go down. So of these total clients, again, you will be able to see the demographics. You can see the age of the consumers. 
how many of them um, are between 60 and 74, and you can get a general idea of their health by the number of ADLs that are listed there, all the way over to the total age um, of 85 and above. And then as you go down the page, you're also going to see how many of those were what age, how many had age missing, how many um, and what their gender is, if the gender was missing. These are the demographics that we report is their age, their gender, whether in fact they are rural, if they live alone, and if they're at poverty, and then race and ethnicity. Those are the targeted demographics that we were looking at that consumer um, as the most vulnerable, the, those who are rural, at poverty, live alone, may have limited English ability, et cetera. Okay, so the remaining cluster one registered services um, are SPR pages eight through 12. You're going to see um, page nine is chore, we, cause we just looked at actually personal care. Um, page eight, homemaker actually, it goes um, horizontal. And then chore is going to be page nine of your report. Home delivered meals are page 10. Adult daycare and health, if you provide that service, it's going to be on page 11. And case management on page 12. Now I want to apologize. I don't want to go too fast. So again, please, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and type them in. We do have a lot to cover, and, and I know with um, I am really trying to keep this as 90 minutes or less um, instead of hold you here longer. So I, I, I want to move right along, but stop me if I'm going too fast. So the same Cluster 1 registered services are also reported to the federal government for the IADLs, which stands for Instrumental Activities of Daily Living. And so here is a slide that's going to explain to you what the IADLs are. So meal preparation, shopping, medication management, managing money, um, housework, light or heavy housework, transportation, those are the IADLs that you are also reporting concerning your consumers who received these lists of Cluster 1 registered services. And IADLs are their inability to perform the listed tasks without some type of assistance, such as full assist, or it could be standby assistant, or just um, some assistance by cues and, and reminders. All right, pages 19, or excuse me, it's 13 through 19, then are going to go through and do your demographic breakdown. So IADLs can also be known as a self-management type of task. Um, and as you are going through here, we're looking again at the total number of consumers who have received these six services. And you can see the stats again on the total number, what their AD or IADL breakout is by the age groups, and then again down through by their demographics, by their gender, um, how many are at poverty, and what those ages are, um, do they live alone, and all the way down to the ethnicity piece. Slide 23 is going to just show us the breakdown of, we looked at total, which is page 16. Then if you move on, actually, um, it was 13. Yes, it is, 13. And then uh, personal care is a page 14, and 15 is homemaker, 16 is chore, home delivered meals, 17. Uh, page 18 will be your IADLs for any consumers who receive the adult daycare. And then lastly, page 19 is the IDLs on your case management. So there's more. And before we introduce you to guests one and, or to the groups one and two, um, I want to just test your knowledge. And so we got a quiz, just a very brief one that's going to come up. And this is something new that we're trying, so um, 
we so hopefully you're going to in a, a minute here um, you're going to see a test your knowledge slide so the poll should be open so which category of services do you collect clients Okay, so you guys should be seeing the poll right now. Okay. So which of these services do we collect demographics for? Do we do that for elder abuse and prevention, for transportation, information for caregivers, case management? Give you a few more seconds to get your answers in there. Were you everybody's paying attention? Say, everybody's saying case management. All right. Hey, you guys did fantastic. <laughs> That's exactly it. Elder abuse and prevention, uh, the federal government does not require the, us to report any demographic information. Transportation, as we already talked about, that would be pretty darn hard. Information for caregiver is a large activity, a large group activity, such as um, providing caregiver information at a fair at, and some type of a, a host activity, but case management is that one-on-one -on -one in which you are reporting the demographics of that. So you guys did very well. Nicely Thank you. Nicely done, yeah. Awesome job. Okay, so now let's break into the group one and group two. As I said, ACL already has referred to the other services as clusters and the, I think it was about 2003 that the federal government, actually it was President Bush, George W. Bush came up with additional funds to allocate into the Older Americans Act and the caregiver services were then added. So they called those Group 1 and Group 2 and you can see from here what those are. Uh, Oregon has Seven, actually. Why does it look like there's eight? Let's see. <laughs> well, I suppose perhaps there's eight. Um, <laughs> we have eight caregiver activities. The federal government did actually choose to rename cash and counseling, and I'll have to remember that and correct this slide because it's no longer cash and counseling. It's now referred to as self-directed care for caregivers. All right, so we're going to move on to page 20 and I want you to look here at section 1E which is identifying the demographics for caregivers serving elderly who are receiving caregiver counseling, caregiver support groups, caregiver training, respite care, supplemental services, and cash and counseling. So you can see here that during this year that this report is for, which happens to actually be uh, 2011, that 2,057 caregivers serving elderly were reported and the demographics go on from there. Um, unfortunately, we had 727 with age missing. That actually means that the... Um, or no, that does not. Pardon me. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Forget that one. So um, we have 727 with age missing. Of those caregivers, you can see the gender breakdown. An awful lot had gender missing. Um, we have rural missing. So back in 2011, we had a lot of missing data. Um, I can assure you now that I'm very pleased with the AAAs. There has been quite an increase, but I will be running some reports and um, providing you with additional information so that you can personally see the data that is missing in your agency um, so that we can brush up on that. But I think you should find most of you are doing a good job of getting that data in. We've come a long way since 2011. You can do a lot in six years or five years actually. So let's um, go ahead and we're going to look at the SPR page that is actually identifying the number of caregivers who served children. And you might notice here that a caregiver who is serving children, we report for anybody who is 55 and over, whereas those serving elderly is actually reported at 60 and over. So 195 caregivers were reported back in 2011 as um, serving children. 
you can see that we had 192 of the um, caregivers with an age, and here's their age breakdown. Nobody was 85 and over caring for grandchildren. I'm, I'm relieved Thank to goodness. hear that. Yes, <laughs> and fewer um, than 12, in fact, were between 75 and 84, so that's also good news. Um, you can see that the majority of caregivers serving children are indeed women, um, rural locations, and it looks as if they are, um, the, a significant number are not Hispanic or Latino. And if you go down here to the um, ethnicity and race, you'll see that um, 41 had race missing. So it appears actually from this report that the greatest number of those are, were black or African American. The number of white is only three. Now we know that's not really accurate, so this is a great example of data was not input into the system, and so the data that we had to report to the federal government in 2011 had a lot of voids in it, and it doesn't look good. Now also the latter part of this section is telling the actual relationship. So we see that 137 of the 195 individuals were grandparents. And 196 of them were a total number of children that were 18 or younger. All right. So next up, this is a fascinating section. This is actually the service financial. This is great. You're going to enjoy this page. So let's go ahead and look at slide uh, 30. This is your SPR page 22. Now what you're going to see here is the actual breakdown of clusters. So this first section up here is called cluster one and you'll see personal care, homemaker, chore, home delivered meals, the number that were NSIP um, eligible home delivered meals, and adult day care and case management. Then we break into the cluster two. And cluster two is assisted transportation, congregate meals, the NSIP eligible number of congregate meals, and nutrition counseling. Then the others, which are called non-registered, that they would want us to report on are the transportation, legal assistance, nutrition education, information and assistance, outreach, other services, those, um, this page is populated from other pages and we're going to, we'll see those in a few more slides. And then our health promotion activities and the self-directed care, which at this time was indeed referred to as cats and counseling. Now as you go across here, you'll see that we are required to report the number of providers that are providing this pulls from Oregon Access. We're also going to report the number of AAAs that are self-providing the service. This is always of interest to the federal government because the Older Americans Act actually requires that these services be contracted out in a competitive process. However, we are permitted to self-provide case management, information and assistance, and administration. Any other service should not be self-provided unless there is a reason. And suitable reasons are if there is not a provider in your district or if you can evidence that your AAA can provide the service more economically than providing that service. So we are providing, um, I mean, we are reporting the number of AAAs who are self-providing. Then you'll see the number of unduplicated persons served. Then you'll see the total number of services, of service units provided. You'll see the total number of 3B OAA dollars, actually not Title 3B supportive, but OAA Title 3 dollars are here. Then the total service expenditure. The total service expenditure is made up of what, where all of these financials come from are from each of the AAAs are reporting their um, monthly expenditures and then they report a fiscal year end. So they're telling me on this report how much Older Americans Act funds they utilized for each of these services. 
how much program income was received, and you'll see that in the column, how much um, other funding they utilized to provide that, and those are all added up and present here on this line. You'll see the breakout of for personal services, um, the support services Title III B funds that were utilized. Zero C1 and C2 were utilized, which is good because those are both nutrition. And um, zero D, which is evidence health. So again, as you go all the way down through this page, you will find that you have all of your data there. Um, you actually, right now, you're in your own personal SPRs. The financial data is not present unless you've placed it there. I uh, assemble the financial data separately and then I just place it on the statewide report. However, in the future, when we roll out the federal um, tool, you will have an opportunity to actually input your fiscals into there. And so that will be an upcoming webinar on the new um, federal tool that we'd like you to begin using. And how soon? What, what is Actually, that? we um, hope to implement that this federal fiscal year, and so um, this, later this month, I will be meeting with um, the AAAs to discuss rolling that out this year. Okay, so federal so, fiscal year is October? It's, it is, and okay. we want to, um, yeah, so we will be discussing that. If everybody's prepared, we'd really like to launch this um, this, this year, this summer, and so we'll talk about that. It, it's a great system, easy system. Um, it'll, it'll really relieve each of the AAAs of a, a lot of the burden that they're having to do right now. Great. We'll look forward to that. Thanks. Yes. Okay, so now um, Section B, caregivers serving elderly. This, we're looking at the financials. So we just looked at the financials for all of the registered services. We're now looking at financials exclusively for the caregivers. And again, we separate out the caregivers serving elderly from the caregivers serving children. So the system will look in Oregon Access, the system will look at the recipient date of birth and that is how it knows which page to actually put the number of caregivers served and the units and the number of providers. So looking here at the page 23 of the SPR which is 31 in our handout You'll, um, again, the expenditures are populated by the state unit on aging and they're based on your final audited fiscal year. You can see that for the federal government, we have you report the number of counseling, caregiver counseling, caregiver support groups, and caregiver training separately. But on this system, in this system, the federal government wants us just to collectively report all three of those on one line you'll see 1,277 uh, caregivers were served and a total of 5,643 units were provided. And this says 55 um, providers actually provided those units. And you carry on down through those rows and you'll find respite care, the supplemental services, cash and counseling, access assistance, and information services are the only two caregiver groups that do not, re or caregiver services that do not require demographics. The others all require demographics. But because access assistance is that one-on-one -on -one INA, it's not feasible for you to be asking an individual on the phone to or in your office to complete an APIS registration form when all they want right now is information about your caregiver services. And then the information services, as I said a little earlier, is a large group activity. So when you're going out again and you may be at a fair or some type of a large event, and you're providing information, it's not feasible that you are documenting anything. So it's referred to as an estimated consumer count. So you may estimate, and you'll see here that in the year 2011, um, there was an estimated number of 11,285 individuals, potential caregivers or individuals interested, who were served with information services in a large audience activity and there were 1,682 large audience activities that were held in Oregon. 
Next up is the very same information, but it's pertaining to caregivers serving children. So um, this time I'll just go from the bottom up. We're going to look at information services. You can see that it is uh, that 148 events were held and only 30 individuals, approximately 30 individuals uh, attended. Now this may be under-reporting um, or over-reporting. It's hard for me to tell, but as as you learn these reports and become more in tune to what you are reporting, I expect that you're going to find you have a lot more confidence in what your SPR says. In 2011, I'm not certain that this was real accurate. Again, we have um, four accesses and um, access and assist, access assistance, which is basically your one-on-one -on -one I and A with a caregiver, 420 individuals were served, and the number of units were, and one unit is one contact. So this looks like many people came back and asked more questions, if we're to interpret this um, accurately. And then, you know, we've already talked about going up the row, um, you can see all of that data. So let's go ahead and we're going to move along to another section. This is actually page 25 of your SPR and this data is not any, this page is not a AAA responsibility. This is where I enter in the expenditures that we have expended for elder abuse um, prevention, awareness um, prevention activities and also what we have expended as a state in legal assistance development. So here we're going to look at other services. Remember um, we looked at Section 2A, which had just those services that the Air, uh, that's ACL, the Administration on Community Living Wanted, reported. All of the other services that funds are expended for, or expended on, and provided go on section 2E. And this could be one, two, or three pages depending upon um, what the AAAs have done. So the multiple pages, they may, they're um, in your SPR, all three, if you have three uh, pages of other service, you're going to find that the system will name that page 26 for each of those. So you'll have three page 26. So don't be alarmed if you happen to see that on your own individual report. Um, this one has only has one actually because when the SPR um, was uploaded from RAIN, excuse me, um, only this at that time that I did that, this is the only services that had been reported at that time. But you can see here that it has the list of service names. You can see what that service unit classification is. Is it an activity? Is it um, a meal? Is it a contact? Is it an hour? Is it a call? And you will notice the um, there is a mission category. On your actual SPR, you'll see a little legend on the bottom that actually identifies A through D and what that mission is. And I, I apologize, I, um, I don't recall what they are, so I, I can't share that with you. Um, the next column over, again, is your total OAA expenditures. Then we have the total number of expenditures that were expended for that service, the number of uh, persons served, and the Estimated service units, which I don't know why it says estimated, because I do expect that you know the exact, and that's what I would like to have reported, is the exact service unit. But um, probably the this is a template created by the federal government, and perhaps at that time they didn't know whether in fact you know what what each of the states are doing, so they put estimated there. But we we are requiring this is not estimated. We would like to know accurately what what number of consumers you have um, served. All right, so next up is the last two sections. We have um, section three, which is agency and state information, and section four, which is the community and um, elder abuse prevention accomplishments. So, Page 27, you'll notice, is populated by the State Unit on Aging and actually identifies the number of staff 
that we have in our unit and their uh, role. So you can see we have one point, at this time, we had 1.25 um, management staff. We had two um, that fit into planning, three into development, uh, two administrative, and then it, it goes down here and into identifying. We also had two for care coordination, and a total of 10.25, of which zero were minority at that time. In fact, we have zero minority again this year, too. The, page, the next page, 28, is actually your agencies. This one is an aggregate of all 17 agencies. So what you're going to see here is all 17. So we have 31 um, directors or management staff that have been reported, of which 1.25 is a minority. Uh, you have five planning, we have 7.92 in development, 21.99 administrative, and so on. For the service delivery, um, your administrative clerical support, and the number of volunteers. So this all comes from what you input into the system. Next up, we're going to look at page 29 and page 30, which is a focal point and also the number of providers and those, um, what that provider um, makeup is, whether in fact they are rural or a minority. And this is a checkbox in Oregon Access is where this comes from, the provider module. So the entry screen has, in, in um, the provider module in Oregon Access, it has a minority checkbox and a rural checkbox, and so as well as a, a checkbox that indicates, in fact, you can see that I put a, um, on, on this screen, you can see that I have actually put a screenshot of that page. So you can see that if, the, if you have a contractor no longer providing, you need to go in and inactivate them by checking the inactivate provider. Otherwise, it's going to be numbered on section 2A, which tells the number of providers um, providing the service. Here you indicate if it's your own AAA providing the service, whether it's a minority or a rural provider, and that all appears on the report. Then we have um, the makeup here of our focal points. Now, a focal point is any location in which an individual can go and learn about the services that your AAA provides. So as you can see, in 2011, uh, 122, AAAs reported 122 focal points of which 78 were actually senior centers. And um, the number of senior centers that your AAA had, um, or no, that had been reported in the past year was 99. I recognize that was not accurate, so I go in now and um, I have created and look in, um, in, on the web for the number of senior centers, and so I have created a table identifying that Oregon actually has, uh, I believe right now off the top of my head, 133 uh, senior centers within Oregon. Of this nine reported nine during that year, AAA is also reported actually providing Older American Act Fund services, I mean, Older American Act funds to 42 of those, and those funds are in addition to contracts for services. So that's the number of senior centers who received assistance from you via with Older Americans Act, but it was not compensated for a service provided. All right. So the last um, two sections here or no, one section perhaps, I, but it is two separate pages. So SPR page 31 and 32 is the accomplishment. And each year you are asked to note your accomplishment. And those um, AAAs, I recommend you make, um, you just keep a, a log of different events that, that you have been able to accomplish and different things that you want to highlight. Um, then for both of these, in, for example, it was last year Oregon Cascades West held an elder abuse 
um, oh goodness, Randy Moore, if I had a mic on you, you could tell us. Anyway, they had a nice event in which the uh, Department of Justice came and talked about elder abuse prevention. Um, they had other speakers there. And so that would certainly be something that they would want to highlight as an accomplishment for the system of elder rights for that particular year. Okay, boy, we have cruised. I hope I haven't um, gone too fast. So do you have any questions and comments right now that you want to talk about? Anything over the that you want to talk about related to what we've already discussed? Coming up, we're actually going to talk about how to utilize the data that you've collected. But anything related to the SPR, now's your opportunity. And if not, we'll go ahead and proceed. So everybody catch your breath. Uh, yes, stand up if you want to, stretch, <laughs> take a drink, blow your nose. She only has a few more pages, but we, but it is exciting for us to be able to talk about now that you've collected all this data and we've put it all in the report, now how can we use it and how can it be helpful to us and what can we learn from it? So I'm excited to hear about this. All right. So next up, you've collected all the data. Let's discuss some ideas of how to utilize it to your benefit. So annual data reports can assist you in so many different ways, um, particularly right now, uh, as all 17 area agencies are actually developing their upcoming area plan. I would expect that the data available, and if you happen to not have your um, last couple of SPRs available, send me an email. You'll find um, my contact information is on your handout, the last page probably, and I'd be happy to send that out. If you are representing an ADRC and um, don't happen to have your uh, local AAA's SPR and you'd like to see that, again, send it to me, send your request and I'll go ahead and email it out to you. So the data is really important um, for your strategic planning of your area plan. It also um, helps you bring your staff on board. The more your staff is aware of what you're doing, the better they feel about their job, their role. And, and so this is definitely information. Um, I hope that as we've gone through the pages, you recognize that this is significant information, particularly when you're looking at your individual SPR. You ought to, I mean, this is your performance. You, you ought to get that out there and show your staff. You can place this on your website. Uh, I definitely recommend that you look at providing this information to your legislative representatives to your advisory boards, to your board of directors, to any of your partner agencies. Um, let it be known in newsletters. Civic groups. Civic groups are one of the most generous groups out there. And if they are aware of what your performance is and what your focus is, when you go and you're soliciting and doing some fundraising activities, what better way actually to demonstrate what you're going to do with the money and that vulnerable population of individuals that are being served in your particular area. Um, public events, you know, I just, I toot your horn. Um, get out there and let them know what your agency is doing. And as you guys know, that each of you has a liaison, so we can help you with some of that and or Christy Murphy from our team is really good at that kind of stuff too. So, you know, you have some technical assistance available if you need help with trying to figure out what that looks like for your particular area. And I imagine that some of you have some ideas of your own. Do you have anything you want to um, just go ahead and share with the rest of us group as to how this data may benefit you? So feel free to text chat it in as we move to the next slide. Um, we'd be happy to share anything y'all want to share. Uh, you guys a quiet group, huh? It is a quiet group. Okay, so um, let's move on. Let me just show you this um, is an example of how you can pull your data together. I actually 
may have this template um, that we could provide to you if you want to actually plug in uh, this your own data and uh, this is actually again an older report this is uh, from fis federal fiscal year 2011 I mean 2010 and we've titled this older Americans Act profile and so you can see here that 54,000 consumers unduplicated um, the average age of those consumers was 60 to 74. Uh, Ten percent of those consumers received one or more registered service, and I know you are all familiar with the registered <laughs> service now, and if you need a <laughs> reminder, look to your right and you'll see that list of registered services. You can see that during this year, adult daycare was not heavily funded. Um, I have seen through the last two years um, that there's been a real increase in triple A's actually providing adult daycare. I'm not certain whether that's because there are more adult daycare um, health day care facilities that have opened up or if the triple A's are just finding that there is a greater need in their area and so they've had to um, add that service as one that they're providing. But at this year it was just $130 that were provided. Um, you can see the breakdown of all of those expenditures between the registered and the non-registered. And then we have our pie chart. Um, Eight million dollars were spent on registered service, whereas um, 15, 1.5 million actually, were spent on non-registered. Then as you go down again, you can just see, so this is just a visual for you as an example of how you can compile your data. And on the next screen, you're going to see the next slide yeah, here. Gonna, let's see. Oh, hold on. Um, we might have a question here. Who, okay, so who in a AAA can typically access the SPR data to use in planning or quality review? Is the data easily available to most of the staff at AAAs? Um, so that's oh, one. all right. So um, let me talk about accessing the data. Okay. In Rain, as we said, in Oregon Access, so at any time during the year, if you want to look at your data, um, Oregon Access is uploaded midnight to Rain, and if you don't have a Rain account, you'll see that um, on the back of your handout how to obtain the login if you have an Oregon Access account that is actually the same login and the same password of course it would have to be because again the system's extracting it from Oregon Access so you're going to log into Rain with that very same login name and and your password and you will be able to view in Rain exactly from July 1st of the prior year up to whatever present the, the prior day that you're viewing it that is the data that's in there um, I recommend that you actually wait until, if you're going to do look at doing a report such as this, you're going to want to wait until your SPR is complete. And each of the AAAs have um, contacts that they have provided, so they have a director, a fiscal manager, and a data entry individual that is responsible for the data and their report is emailed out to them as well as, again, they can see their full report right there in RAIN. And um, so for those who may not receive it, if they're not the, if your director or your fiscal person or your data person isn't passing it on, again, you can go into RAIN with an account that you have asked us to set up and you can see it yourself. So it's out there, it's available, and um, we could consider putting this on the SUA website. Uh, we'll have to talk about that. It, it might be something that AAAs are interested in doing just for an easier way of accessing. But typically it sounds like the AAA directors and or the fiscal person and or a data entry person. So th at least three people usually at each agency that people could go to and say, I want, I'd like to see this or I'd like to see a copy of it or... Yes. Okay, Exactly. Cool. Thank yes. you. And we're always happy to give you an account to RAIN too. There's, um, there's, it's view only, um, so there's no risk of you uh, manipulating the data, so it, it's harmless. Anybody in your agency can have 
um, rights to view this, and so just send, um, well, at the end here, you'll see uh, I have some instructions, so you can send those out to me. Thanks for the question. I appreciate that. All right, so um, this is, we're going to look now at page two of this data assembly. And so here you can see that we've just, um, in the year 2010, we just gave visuals of the actual age of the individuals. We talked about whether they're urban or rural, um, the caregivers, the gender, and those core services, which again are those registered services, and the race and ethnicity. You'll see here um, in this one that 91% of all services were actually, um, I don't want to say consumed because that has the tendency to mean eating, but um, <laughs> were, were benefited by white individuals. Okay, so these are great examples of the kinds of pictures that we can, you know, the, the kind of one pager with pictures and graphics. And again, uh, Christy Murphy from our team can really help you with some of those. And you do have a liaison that can also help and connect you with some of that information. Thanks, Rhonda. Uh huh. You're welcome. Okay, so other uses um, SBR data is useful in identifying areas to target. And so if we move on to um, slide 47, page 47 in your handouts, uh, Older Americans Act target population. We are to target low income, those residing in rural areas, the greatest economic need, uh, low income minority individuals, the limited English proficiency, those at risk for institutional placement, those with severe impairments. And uh, the Older Americans Act, we have been operating on Older Americans Act reauthorization from 2006. It has now just been reauthorized, and so we will soon uh, be operating our services under Older Americans Act reauthorization 20. I believe it is 2015 or 16. I, I can't remember which year they attributed it to. It was it was begun in 2015. They've completed and fully authorized the the act, reauthorized the acts in 2016. So it may actually be a reauthorized 2016 act. And um, there will be additions to that act. And so I do believe they may have targeted, uh, they have increased that target population mm -hmm. to include the LGBT, let's see, LGBTQ okay. population. Is there a Q on the end of there too? Sometimes. Okay. And it's sometimes Q. <laughs> and there may be other additions. So we'll, we'll have to dive in and mm -hmm. dissect the new reauthorized act to determine what else we have. But in terms, oh, we have a comment. Uh, just that Deb is telling us it was 2016. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Deb. Yep, thanks for the clarification. So soon we will all be operating under the reauthorized 216 Older Americans Act. So in terms of talking, um, you know, the ADL, Activities of Daily Living, um, that higher number indicates a higher impairment, and so when you're targeting individuals, you're looking at this data, you can track the number of highly um, impaired older Oregonians that are receiving services from your agency, and um, in the little screenshot here, I again have reminded you what those registered services are in which you are tracking your ADLs and your IDLs. Again, in terms of targeting, you can look at your data and increase, you know, can strive to increase the participation of low income clients. And when, if you look here on uh, slide 49, oh, sorry, there we go, you'll notice <laughs> that of the 50,000, I think that's a five or maybe it's a six, yeah, it's, they're pretty small numbers here, 50,649, um, 11.2 of those are actually below poverty. That seems, I don't know, it seems low, but maybe maybe that's just right on and, and a good number. Um, although, oh I see, no wonder. Uh, yeah, I looked down at my own, uh, <laughs> my own uh, slide to see that I did tell you here, 47.7% of the clients actually do have missing information. So um, your data 
is only as good as what you put in it. So if we're going to talk about usefulness of data um, and using it for targeting purposes, you certainly do want to also make sure that you have your uh, demographics in the system. But if you have the data there, then you can show all these other things. And yes. And again, um, a data and analyzing it, um, it, it really equates to money. I, I just truly believe that your performance is demonstrating to the federal government as well as Oregon's legislative body that we are expensive funds as they intended and um, and it's just very useful for fundraising. So um, targeting also just this very, I think this might be one of the last things that, that we are talking about is increasing that ability to demonstrate, again, that you are meeting that target population. And you can do that by reducing the amount of missing information. And so again, on this particular slide, you can see that the total number of registered clients, you'll see that uh, in 2011, 18% um, actually had age missing and their gender was missing, 18%. Um, the rural and poverty missing, we had 20.3% and 39.8, and then that live alone missing, 31.4. Now I do understand, it's sometimes very difficult to get this information. Um, if I was at a congregate site and someone came up and said, hey, do you live alone? I'm not readily going to answer that question because I feel vulnerable. I'm aged in and, and um, you know, I, I just don't want people to know whether I live alone. However, if somebody were to sit down quietly and have um, a, a conversation mm -hmm. as that individual is completing their NAPAS registration, they can explain why that question is asked because it is demonstrating that your agency is meeting that target population that the, the funds are intended for. And you can also reassure that individual that this data doesn't go anywhere. You're going to actually, um, we don't need to, you'll notice the NAPAS registrations have been updated over the last couple of years. We've, we have no longer asked anything except are you above or below poverty. We don't need to have specific ranges. However, in Oregon Project Independence, that is not the same. So if you are uh, completing a consumer record for a consumer of OPI, Oregon Project Independence, then you may be adding more information than just an OAA. But for the OAA consumer, we just need them to indicate if they are below or below, I mean above poverty. So if you have any questions or comments, you need to text chat it in. We aren't going to open the phone lines, um, but we, it looks like Rhonda's going to finish up here. Yes, so let's just look at our very last slide. And um, these are just some follow-up actions that you should consider. Ensure that your consumers are updating their NAPAS registrations annually. We already talked, you know, about the poverty level changes each February. Consumers relocate. They may have been rural or urban, and that's changed. And sadly enough, we know um, that spouses and companions die, and so they may live alone now. And so we do want that uh, reflected in Oregon Access, so it's uploading into the report. If you're not sure if you have security access to RAIN, again, email me or Lori Watt, and here is Lori's email address. Let us know um, that you want to find out, and we'll let you know. And if you don't, um, we'll walk you through what will be necessary to provide you with that security access. And definitely, please, go to RAIN. There is the website right there. Now, I want to warn you, right now, um, the state is in the process of navigating from Internet Explorer 10 to Internet Explorer 11. And so when you click and you go to this site, you're going to see a certificate warning. Um, just There's nothing to worry about. Um, the certificate has expired. It is a secure site. You will see HTTPS up there. And you can go ahead and just select the center one, which is to proceed without um, concern. And you'll get right in there. And you'll be able to review the data anytime you want. It's uploaded every night 
at midnight, and um, and it mirrors exactly what the pages that we are looking for or looking at. In fact, rain is a lot easier to to print rather than um, the federal report um, because rain will print everything right there on. It should fit on one page, whereas if you were to go into the federal report, it's going to download as Excel, and you'll have to go in and, and paginate and format each of your your worksheets, which is far more tedious. So, Edie, um, if you need any further assistance, please don't hesitate to call me. I love data. I just I love this <laughs> stuff, and I would be happy to talk with you guys about anything that you need some assistance with. So we want to thank you very much, Rhonda, for going through um, and taking us step by step. It was really interesting and helpful, I think. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, I want to thank all of you guys for being with us. And um, remember uh, to watch out for an email from Lori Watt that's going to have a little link to a survey monkey. Uh, it won't take you but just a few minutes, and you can let us know um, if we get how we can improve this, if we do it again, um, you know how our webinars are doing just in general. Um, we have been recording this, and we will be posting it by next week, um, if not sooner, maybe even by the end of the week. I also want to remind you guys that our we do this monthly, and our June webinar will be on June 22nd. It's going to be a little bit later, but we will be talking about the Consumer Satisfaction Survey, and we'll have Diana White with us um, to be talking about that. So we will send an email out about that one, and um, if we don't have any more questions, it's really getting close to three, so don't hesitate to call Rhonda or contact your liaison. Uh, we really appreciate you guys being here today, and we really appreciate Rhonda's time. Thanks again, everybody. We'll, we'll keep it open for a minute or two just in case anybody has questions.